Okay, starting with 22 now. Name three climate proxies, and for each one, give a short explanation. Uh, well, one that we talked about was uh, pollen. With pollen, you're going to look at a sample of soil, um, and let's say you find pieces of pollen in it like this, and this is going to be the newer stuff, and this is going to be the older stuff. And if you find certain types of pollen down here that can only exist in, let's say, hot climates, so things like deciduous trees, oak trees, um, maple, tall grasses, well, that tells you that it used to be warm. And let's say up here you find things like pine trees and coniferous trees. These are things that it needs to be cold. So that, that tells you that it started out warm and it got cold. So again, just look at the type of plants. Another climate proxy we talked about was po uh, pollen, as you said, was uh, tree rings. And the idea behind this is that a uh, thick tree ring indicates a tree grew a lot, so that is like favor favorable conditions, and that generally means warmer. So a thicker tree ring means it was warmer. A thinner tree ring means a tree like barely grew that year. That means it was probably colder that year. And the third type we can talk about is uh, greenhouse gases uh, trapped inside ice, which is actually one of the feedback cycles too. Um, Basically, inside bubbles in ice cores, you can look and you can you can see the the amounts of CO2 and methane that were in the in the air at the time. So, if they crack open an, an air bubble and capture the gas inside, and let's say scientists can correlate that with uh, two million years ago, uh, which they can do, um, they could say, "Well, look, there was a lot of CO2 back here back then, so that means it was probably very warm back then." Okay. 23. Think back to the heating up rocks slash soil versus water lab. Uh, so variables. For that lab, the independent or manipulated variable is going to be the type of surface, because that's the thing we change. Uh, so whether it's rock or soil or water. Uh, the dependent variable is the temperature after you heat it up. Temperature. Remember, dependent is like our data. The data we took was the temperature. And uh, finally, the controlled variables or constants were things like the same bulb, the same lamp, the same angle of lamp, the same distance, the same time that we heated it up for, the same uh, starting temperature, the same uh, surface underneath. These are all controlled variables. 24. What is the tilt of the Earth? The Earth's tilt is 23.5 degrees, so this is, let me just draw, this is straight up, that's zero, but what the true tilt is, is sort of like that, 23.5 degrees. And why is this important? Well, it's important because it allows us to have seasons. So if you want to imagine the sun, if the sun were shining on this Earth, and the sun, and you know, the sun were here, and this Earth just went straight around like this all year round. Well, the middle of the earth would just get baked year round. Just super hot deserts. No, you know, no real life could thrive there. It'd be too hot. And the top of the earth would never receive direct sunlight. It'd always be super cold. So again, you'd have ice covering the top and bottom of the earth, and the middle would just be a barren wasteland desert. Uh, fortunately, because of our tilt and the fact that it goes around and maintains that tilt, Different parts of the earth are exposed to more direct sunlight at different times. So that's why we can have seasons. That's why there's a little bit more diversity of life on earth. 24, so 25 is next. Uh, all right, so this is our earth-sun relationship. So let's start with our sun. And let's draw our earth. So you want to draw the earth, the axis, which is tilted, of course, and you want to draw the equator. So let me start over here. Now my axis is tilted, and that's my equator. The equator has to go perpendicular to the axis. Don't make it straight across like this. It has to be opposite the axis. So we'll do the same thing over here. Same thing up here. Same thing over here. And, and make sure you indicate a direction. I believe this is correct. I believe it goes counterclockwise. I may be wrong, though. No? Either way, it's reversed. All right, so let's identify our seasons. So direct sun rays are going to come and strike here. 
And again, you're looking for which angle is kind of more tilted towards the sun. Well, in this case, it's the south. So here is going to be 23.5 degrees south, which is the Tropic of Capricorn. And since it's in the southern hemisphere, this is going to be winter for us. So this is going to be December 20th through 21st. 20th through 21st. And we call this, we call this the winter solstice. If you were in Australia, you would call that the summer solstice. Uh, well, opposite that, the sun's going to be hitting now the northern hemisphere because the north is a little more tilted toward the sun. Uh, so the sun's hitting 23.5 degrees north, which is the Tropic of Cancer. And for us, we're going to call that summer. Uh, so this is going to be June, June 20th or 21st. And uh, that's going to be our um, summer solstice. So winter solstice, summer solstice. Okay, and now to look at the angles of these two, we have to see, well, we're starting 23.5 south. Six months later, we're at 23.5 north. So what's the halfway point? Well, it's going to be right on the equator. So here it's hitting the equator, and then here it's going from north to south. So again, it's going to hit the equator. Uh, so uh, now let's talk about the month. We're going from December to June, so halfway between is going to be March 20 through 21. And then June through December, halfway is going to be September 20 through 21. So this is our, these are our two equinoxes. This is going to be autumnal or fall equinox, and that's vernal or spring equinox. Okay. Uh, next. Sketch a label drawing that illustrates the greenhouse effect. So it starts with the sun. Let's just assume that number 26 is the sun. And here's going to be my earth. Well, sun rays are direct. They pass right through greenhouse gases. Let's make sure we're clear. This is sunlight. Okay. And some of that sunlight is just going to bounce right off into space. And now that we talked a little more, we know that that's going to be on like um, uh, when it hits ice. When it hits ice, it's going to bounce and go right back into space. But most of the sunlight doesn't bounce. It gets absorbed into the earth like this. And then that earth is going to re-release that, but now it re-releases it as heat. And it's important to distinguish between these two because sunlight passes right through greenhouse gases, heat does not. So up here we have greenhouse gases like CO2, CH4, and H2O that are going to absorb that heat and re-release it in random directions. So some of that's going to go off to the side, some of it's going to go up, and some of it's going to come down. Now, not every gas is a greenhouse gas. There's plenty of uh, N2, there's plenty of O2, but those aren't greenhouse gases. They don't absorb heat. If they did, this planet would look way different. It'd be much hotter. Okay. So that's your basic greenhouse effect. Sunlight passes right through, some sunlight gets re-released as heat, and some of that heat gets re-released back towards the Earth. Twenty-seven. Name several key greenhouse gases. Uh, the main one is CO2. Probably the next most important is CH4, also known as methane. I'll write this down, CO2, carbon dioxide, CH4, which is methane, and H2O, water vapor. These are the three main greenhouse gases. 28. Describe the ice albedo feedback cycle. So the idea with this is that sunlight bounces off certain things, and a good example is it bounces off ice. So if you have a bunch of ice, it's going to bounce right off. So this happens where the ice meets the water. There's ice, and there's water. Okay? So the way this feedback starts is, uh, let's say for some reason it gets a little bit warmer. Well, because it's warmer, some of that ice is going to melt. So the ice now ends here. That means we have more water and less ice. Okay. Well, what effect is that going to have? Well, now there's less sunlight bouncing off into space and more sunlight hitting the water. And when it hits the water, it gets absorbed, causes the water to warm up, which causes more ice to melt. So now we have even more water and even less ice. Well, that's going to cause more sunlight to stay, less to be reflected, and now it's going to cause even more of this ice to melt, and so on. 
So when a cycle feeds back into itself like this, when it gets worse and worse, we call that a positive feedback effect, positive feedback cycle. Um, again, don't think positive in terms of it's a good thing because really it's not. What the positive term comes from is because it feeds back into itself. So it's like the problem, uh, it's self-sustaining because a little change feeds back in, feeds back in, feeds back in. So it's like a positive in that sense. In terms of greenhouse effect, it's a very negative thing for us humans. Uh, but that is a positive feedback cycle. 29. Describe the photosynthesis feedback cycle. Uh, well, the basic process is uh, CO2 plus, uh, not H2O, sorry, CO2 plus O2 yields uh, H2O plus sugars. No, oh, I was right the first time. Sorry. Yes, of course. There we go. So that's what plants do. Uh, that's how oxygen came to Earth. Um, and that's what happens to our CO2. A lot of it goes into plants. So that carbon ends up in sugar. Uh, so the feedback cycle starts with, uh, for some reason, uh, it heats up. Well, when it heats up, plants generally do better. So there are more plants, and therefore there's more photosynthesis. And the more this process happens, the more CO2 gets converted into sugar. Therefore, this process pulls CO2 out of the air. Well, when CO2 is pulled out of the air, it's going to get colder. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So basically, it gets warmer, there's more photosynthesis, and then it gets colder. So when nature kind of fixes the problem, it's called a negative feedback cycle. Again, don't get confused because it's a positive thing for us humans, but it's called a negative feedback cycle. Number 30, greenhouse gases trapped in ice. So the idea behind this is that there are, in fact, greenhouse gases trapped inside ice, notably uh, CO2 and CH4. I mean, H2O is really what makes up ice. So carbon dioxide and methane are trapped inside ice. So let's say for some reason it gets warmer, that's gonna cause some ice to melt, that's gonna release the gases that are trapped inside, which is gonna make it even warmer. And that's gonna cause even more ice to melt, which causes more gases to be released, which makes it even warmer. So again, it's feeding back into itself. It's a positive feedback cycle. Again, it's negative for us humans. It's not a good thing, but it's still considered a positive feedback. 31. Weathering of rocks feedback cycle. So with this, all you have to understand is that when rocks weather down chemically, when it, you know, when rainwater rushes over them and they, they break up, there's a little chemical reaction, and this process absorbs CO2. It pulls CO2 out of the air. So the idea behind this one is that it heats up, the planet heats up, that causes more evaporation, which causes more rain, and the more it rains, the more this weathering process happens. And the more the weathering process happens, the more CO2 is pulled out of the air. And then when you remove CO2, you make it colder. So again, we started with the increase in temperature. That led to CO2 being pulled out of the air, which makes it colder. So nature has corrected the problem. We call that a negative feedback. 32. Explain how the three types of rocks are formed. Well, sedimentary rock forms when uh, water, wind, sand breaks big rocks into little tiny particles. And those little tiny particles are called sediment. And it travels, generally travels downstream and it can either gather in a lake or, a, or a, the ocean. And over thousands and millions of years, those little sediments build up and they build up to be hundreds or even thousands of feet high. And once they're hundreds or thousands of feet high, now they have enough weight to kind of crunch the bottom levels into sedimentary rock. It's not like you can have like two feet of sand and, and it's just gonna turn into sandstone. No, it's still gonna be sand. But if you have 2,000 feet of sand, that's enough weight to crunch that sand into sandstone. So it's about um, weathering of rocks to break them into pieces. Those pieces need to build up and then enough weight piles up for it to compress it or cement it into rock. Second type of rock is igneous rock. Uh, igneous rock forms when uh, other rocks melt and then refreeze into, into igneous rock, and that happens inside the earth. So earth and uh, pieces of uh, the earth or the crust enter the mantle, they melt into magma, and they can either cool slowly in the, in the magma, uh, sorry, in the mantle, 
and form certain types of uh, igneous rock, like granite, or they can erupt out of a volcano and cool very quickly and form another type of igneous rock, like uh, obsidian or basalt. Okay. Uh, oh, the third type of rock is uh, metamorphic, and that forms when uh, a certain type of rock or crust will enter the mantle, but it won't necessarily melt. It'll keep going down, 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 where the temperature and pressure get extremely high, and at that very deep point in the mantle, the pressure and temperature cause it to squish and form this completely new rock, metamorphic rock. 33. Magma from the mantle often gets erupted from volcanoes. Explain how the mantle gets replenished with stuff to erupt. Well, uh, the stuff comes back into the earth at subduction zones. So imagine here's a piece of uh, crust, nice big piece of crust like, uh, oh, not ocean, uh, continental crust. And here is the ocean crust, which is thinner. Now when this thick crust meets the thin crust, the thin one's going to get pushed underneath. So it's going to go down like this. And this process generally works like that. So this is how the mantle gets replenished. Again, we have mantle down here, and it's very hot and very high pressure. So as this goes down, it's gonna melt, some of it's gonna melt into magma. And some of it is gonna keep going down and turn into metamorphic rock. 34. How do igneous or metamorphic rocks turn into sedimentary rock? Okay, uh, well, in order for that to happen, they need to be broken down through weathering. So again, it, the rock gets rained on, it gets uh, wind, sand can whip it and, and uh, make little pieces form. And once those pieces form, they're going to travel downstream, they're going to accumulate, and enough weight crunches down on it that it's going to turn into uh, sedimentary rock. Okay, I'll pause there.